it's definitely a tall order. It's funny because 10% might not sound like a lot, right? But it's a big jump from the less than 0.1% that exists globally today. Uh, and we're the largest domestic carrier in the U.S. So for Southwest, that 10% translates into a lot of gallons, right? About 300 million. So the way that we're thinking about it is really um, focusing on securing a diversified portfolio of staff to hit our 2030 goal, but also, you know, beyond that. Um, and we think about diversification in terms of technologies and feedstocks. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. I'm speaking today with Helen Giles, who is the Managing Director of Sustainability at Southwest Airlines. As the largest domestic carrier in the US, Helen has a big task on her hands when it comes to decarbonizing the Southwest Airline fleet. With so many aircraft, flying mostly during the daytime, her challenge is quite different from what many other airlines might face of a similar fleet size. Helen does not shy away from the tough questions when it comes to growth versus sustainability as well. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Helen, welcome to the show. It is such a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, I've had lots of airline heads of sustainabilities. You, of course, are leading sustainability at Southwest Airlines. Can you please tell us a little bit about what your role entails? Yes, and thank you for having me on your show. Uh, so my role is really just to make sure our company addresses our impact on the environment. And so I lead our environmental sustainability team. And at Southwest, that's the E within ESG. Uh, I think about my team in terms of three pillars. You know, we set our goals, we develop our strategy and plan to hit those goals, and we're really partnering across our operation and even outside of our company um, on a number of initiatives. We also focus on reporting. You know, obviously, transparency and accountability are super important. Um, and so my team makes sure that we're reporting out on all of the great work that we're doing, but also recognizing the progress that still needs to be made. Uh, and finally, we work a lot on environmental policy. As you know, the government, you know, plays a big role um, in our efforts. And we collaborate externally um, to advance really sustainability. Our goals have a lot of dependencies and we just can't do it alone. Um, I did want to add our, our structure at Southwest is a bit unique uh, in that environmental sustainability sits within finance. Um, and we have a, a fuel strategy management team that has a, a dedicated sustainable fuels team uh, within their organization. That team is focused on procuring staff and helping to ensure that we hit our goals. And so I mentioned that just to show that we're we are more embedded in our business, um, and at Southwest, sustainability doesn't operate, you know, in a silo. We're we're a very cross functional team. That is interesting. I know we're going to dive deeper into this, but I have to ask: How do you even survive in the finance team? Because <laughs> I'm guessing you do not have the answers to the traditional CFO questions like. What is the ROI? Is this going to drive up my yield? Is this going to drive up my load factor? Because everything you do costs something and doesn't necessarily result in a return. I actually think it's it's more helpful to be on this side, right? Because if you think about the metrics that we track, like cost of bait is a metric that we added, you know, here a few weeks, a few years ago, I mean. Um, and so, we're, you know, we're adding new metrics in terms of how we think about our costs um, and what it takes to, you know, run our operations and hit our goals. But also being more embedded in the business means, you know, a lot of the initiatives that we that we run um, might come out of a different cost center, right? If we're talking about electrifying our ground support equipment, that's our ground operations team. Or if we're talking about, you know, investing in more um, energy efficient equipment in our facilities, that's our corporate facilities team. And so by sitting within finance, we actually have great visibility into all of the initiatives across the company and the spend that's needed to get there. Um, and it helps us really connect those dots, I would say. Very interesting. And of course, you mentioned the SAF team or the fuels team looks at SAF. Do you have a dotted line? How do you work hand in hand with them? 
Yeah, so um, Michael Abishan is our managing director of field strategy management. He and I are on the same team. So we have the same boss, our senior vice president of uh, finance uh, strategy and sustainability. Um, and so we work hand in hand. You know, I would say, like, I'm thinking about our goals, um, how it fits into carbon, um, the criteria for how we assess, you know, our staff, like making sure that's sustainable. And then, you know, his team, I mean, they're the experts on infrastructure, logistics, on relationships with producers. And so I think it's actually um, a super beneficial relationship that we have the experts out there, you know, negotiating the contracts, procuring the fuel, making sure that staff ultimately gets into our planes and um, working so closely with sustainability to support our goals. That That's very interesting. I love that there are overlaps and yet they're, they, you know, they can bring their expertise. Uh, I remember coming out of the pandemic, we were helping a lot of airlines at that time. Southwest created this huge splash. I think it was in 2021 or early, uh, late 2021, where you placed the largest order for the 737 MAX. I think it was 100 firm orders plus 155 options. Growth is what Southwest is about. Your role as head of sustainability is, hey, how do you balance growth and sustainability? Because more planes means more fuel burn, means more pollution. How do you balance growth and sustainability? It's a good question. It's a tricky question, right? Because um, you're right in the sense that growth does make the challenge even harder. Um, but I don't really see, you know, growth and sustainability being mutually exclusive. There's a lot of opportunities that come with growth, right? Um, you mentioned the order book. So as we grow our fleet, we are bringing on newer, more fuel efficient aircraft that's going to help lower our carbon emissions intensity. So we'll be more efficient from a fuel and carbon perspective. Um, and that applies broadly, right? If you think about, you know, ground support equipment, as we expand, we're looking to prioritize actually bringing on electric GSC versus um, combustion GSC. And I know that has a smaller impact, but, you know, in every part of our operation, we're looking for ways to be more operationally efficient to save fuel because every gallon saved is dollar saved, but also carbon saved. Um, and we're modeling that growth, you know, into our plans. That means that we'll need a lot of sustainable aviation fuel, a lot of staff. Um, and so, you know, the other opportunities I would think about is, as you think about growth, um, we can explore how our routes, our schedules could impact contra formation, for example, especially as the research and modeling improve in that area. So there's a lot of opportunity that comes with growth and we're baking that all into our plans. Um, so sort of fleet modernization, operational efficiency and staff will be really crucial to hitting our goals um, as we grow as an airline. So let's talk about carbon intensity because we just touched upon it. I recall looking through your net zero by 2050 plan. I think you aim to reduce carbon emissions intensity by 25% by 2030, 50% by 2035. Now that's great. But what do you answer to, let's say, a climate activist who will say, oh, but your overall emissions are still growing? Intensity versus overall emissions. How do you balance that? It's a good question. I think it's important to do both, you know, obviously. And so um, ultimately hitting net zero by 2050 is is absolute emissions. Philosophically, there is a lot of debate, right, around growth in aviation. And you're probably seeing some trends in Europe that are really aimed at reducing demand and driving up the cost of flying. And very unfortunately, that cost of the energy transition is being pushed onto customers. And that's not a position that we support at Southwest. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, knowing Southwest very, very well. You know, our purpose is to connect people to what's important to their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost travel. That last part, low cost, is really important. Um, we believe in democratizing the skies, and we believe that flying shouldn't be a luxury good. And uh, I think Bloomberg actually recently quoted me saying that, and I stand by what I said. If you think about the growth that's to come through 2050, a lot of that's going to come from people who've never had the means to fly before. And so as we tackle sustainability and, and grow as airlines, we have to do that in a way that ensures an equitable energy trans transition. Uh, there are places like Europe, you know, where there are different modes of transportation, there are options for travelers. But if you think about a lot of the U.S. and in places like New Zealand, even that kind of infrastructure just doesn't exist. Right. There are a lot of communities in this world that depend on air travel to get to where they need to go. And air travel can be really efficient, right? If you think about certain situations where per passenger emissions can be lower from flying than driving. And so I think we have to take all of that into consideration. Yeah, I think it, you're right. There are lots of factors here to be considered. 
Um, I used to live in Boston and I was lucky enough to take the, I think it was called the Acela, uh, down uh, from Boston to New York and then all the way to DC. But I realized that was the only high speed train that was available in the entire country. So I was extremely fortunate that I had access uh, to that. Otherwise, we were just driving, especially in, in the States or in North America. Um, and those options may not even exist in like New Zealand or Norway and, and other places. Uh, still focusing on your net zero plan, SAF is critical. You intend to replace, I believe, 10% of total jet fuel consumption with sustainable aviation fuel by 2030. What's the progress been till now? That's a tall order. And how do you intend to get there? Yeah, you're right. It's definitely a tall order. It's funny because 10% might not sound like a lot, right? But it's a big jump from the less than 0.1% that exists globally today. Uh, and we're the largest domestic carrier in the U.S. So for Southwest, that 10% translates into a lot of gallons, right? About 300 million. So the way that we're thinking about it is really um, focusing on securing a diversified portfolio of SAF to hit our 2030 goal, but also, you know, beyond that. Um, and we think about diversification in terms of technologies and feedstocks, who we partner with, really um, everything. We know it's going to take time for these technologies to scale and commercialize. So our portfolio probably will shift over time. But thinking about 2030, as you asked, um, to think about just sort of the pathways and feedstocks, PEFA we see playing maybe a greater role in the short term as other pathways and feedstocks scale. And the stuff that we're using today in Oakland um, is made from tallow. But there's a lot of competition for HEFA feedstocks. So we do see that pathway ultimately being feedstock limited. Um, alcohol to jet, we see playing a role in 2030 and then really growing in volume beyond 2030. Our primary focus in ATJ right now is to scale up second generation SAF through our investment in Sapphire Renewables. I'm sure you're aware of Sapphire stands for SAF from Renewable Ethanol. And that was a first of its kind of investment for Southwest that we announced in June of last year. Um, it's a company that uh, was actually part of a Department of Energy grant that we uh, matched, and they're focused on the development and production of scalable SAF. Uh, Sapphire intends to use a widely available agriculture residue, corn stover, um, that's the leaves, the stalks, the part of the corn that you don't eat, to make renewable ethanol. And I think it's just a really good example of the sort of private-public partnerships that will be needed for SAF to scale. You, you mentioned the, the, the different pathways to SAF. Uh, power to liquid is one, uh, as feedstocks get depleted, costs also go up. That means the cost of SAF acquiring based on, uh, what you use to procure SAF will go up. How is that going to work out? I mean, who's going to pay for it? You said the cost is being passed to the consumers. What's Southwest philosophy? So we have a staff policy that really governs how we assess opportunities. Um, it's on our website. And part of that policy is thinking about the economics of staff, right? And we say that staff has to be affordable compared to conventional jet fuel. And that's inclusive of government incentives and any other sort of financial drivers. Um, when we're working on sort of our long-term contracts, and we've actually, you know, announced a couple of long-term offtakes, we see opportunity in uh, SAF getting to at or even, you know, below parity, um, depending on sort of the particular SAF and the incentives that are in place. Um, if I just take, you know, Fisher Tropes sort of gasification as an example, um, we've announced a couple of odd takes that those producers are um, focused on using waste wood biomass as a feedstock, but also as a power source and integrating carbon capture and sequestration technology into their production process. So because of that, they actually are going to produce deeply carbon negative SAF. And that is very beneficial from a government incentive standpoint, the clean fuel production credit and even California's low carbon fuel standard, you know, will reward that, those um, ultra carbon negative uh, SAFs. So, you know, I think depending on the pathway, the feedstock, the carbon intensity of, of the SAF, the incentives that are in place, you know, we are really focused on um, securing affordable SAF as part of our policy. And part of what we're focused on sort of in our long-term contracts. I'm looking forward to seeing what sort of off-take agreements uh, and other announcements you have uh, in store for us in the coming months, because you're right, you're going to grow. It's not 10%. You're growing the, the SAF use 100x from 0.1% or, or lesser to 10%. Uh, again, while reviewing your net zero plan, I saw currently or previously you've had offsets or verified offsets as one of the ways you're uh, looking at reaching net zero. But in the future, that's not going to be the case in 2050. You've been in this role for over three years now. 
Has your view changed when it comes to offsets and what role are they uh, going to play going forward? Uh, my my perspective definitely has changed over the past few years. You know, uh, as you know, a lot happens in the span of, of a year in this space. Um, and carbon offsets, they can be a controversial area. Our philosophy has always been that we have to focus on decarbonizing our operation, right? That's where our time, our effort, our resources are best spent. Um, but we're also well aware that aviation is a hard to abate sector. And that means it's a challenge to really demonstrate meaningful you know, abatement in the near term. So when we first announced our voluntary goals and strategy in 2021, um, we thought that offsets could be a bridge in the near term to address a portion of emissions, particularly around sort of growth, right? We talked about earlier, um, while SAF and other technologies scaled. What's really changed in the past couple of years, I would say, is um, a lot in terms of the broad landscape. We've seen a ton of promising movement in the policy side of things, right? We've got the Inflation Reduction Act um, on the federal side. We've seen a ton of momentum on the state side. You know, you've got the West Coast, but then um, with Illinois, uh, Michigan, Minnesota coming online, there's a lot more state incentives. Um, there's even been, you know, more solidification around like staff accounting guidance from greenhouse gas protocol. You're seeing producers really invest more in, in carbon capture and sequestration and also just in announcing more off, uh, more production and more availability of staff. So I think with all of this in mind, we saw, you know, a path to hitting our goals without um, relying on offsets. Now, to be clear, we're not completely dismissing offsets. I think there's value in supporting decarbonization outside of your value chain. There are quality projects out there. There are ones that are worth supporting. And so we do see specific use cases where offsets could play a role. Um, right now, we're voluntarily offsetting emissions that are uh, from our employee business travel on Southwest and on tickets that we donate to charitable partners. So we actually um, uh, announced a partnership with uh, a partner of ours that we use on the aircraft leasing side. And they're developing these um, high quality cook stove projects that have really good social co-benefits. And so that's something that we're also sort of considering in any, you know, voluntary offsetting that we do. Uh, but as you know, as part of Corsia, airlines will have to offset, you know, international emissions above 85% of 2019 levels. So that will play a part, I think, in everyone's um, roadmap. And then some of our customers, not, not all, but some want the option to be able to purchase offsets. So we do offer that on um, our website, and we're the only uh, airline in the U.S. that actually offers loyalty points and a dollar for dollar match. Um, we want to you know, reward those c customers that choose to participate in the program. And we always evaluate kind of new new ways to engage our customers on sustainability. So all I have to say, you know, we aren't counting offsets towards our voluntary goals. Um, our path to net zero roadmap shows how we can get there without using offsets. But our plan has a lot of dependencies. You know, if things fall through like staff scaling, like, you know, the modernization of air traffic control, um, the industry may very well, you know, need offsets to hit these goals because they're quite ambitious. Are offsets currently offered on the Southwest website as an option for passengers? I'm just curious. On southwest.com slash want to offset carbon, you can uh, go there and, you know, use a calculator, put in your flight and then um, offset, offset your flight. And is this offered only to end customers like you and I, or is this for corporate passengers as well or businesses? Um, any individual traveler can go on our website and offset their flight. I think, you know, if you're, if you're booking travel within sort of like a corporate booking tool, um, we don't have it there yet, but our website, you know, anyone business or leisure can, can access that and, and offset their flight. What sort of take up rate have you seen uh, for voluntary offsets? Not mine, to be honest. Um, I think part of it is, you know, obviously it's not in the booking path, um, but we've done a lot of research to figure out, you know, where, how do customers want to engage airlines on sustainability? Where do they want to engage? And we're also not seeing customers say they want it in the booking path either, because I think they're really focused on booking their flight, right? It's a very stressful process, and that's probably what you're primarily focused on. Um, but the take rate isn't high, and it's very interesting because when we ask customers, you know, do you care about sustainability? Um, the vast majority say they do. When you ask them, if they, you know, want the option to offset or, or if they would offset, the vast majority say that they, they would. And then when the, the option is actually out there, there's a little bit of a gap, right? The say-do gap that we see um, for customers. And I'm sure that's not specific to aviation. Oh, there's a big gap. There's a huge say-do gap, even in climate-aware uh, countries and markets we see. So I, I think in Northern Europe, 
the conversion rate is between three to seven percent, and that's a very highly flammable air market we're looking at. So I, I've heard of airlines saying anywhere from one percent to two percent is really good, and that's where I think the push pushback comes from IT teams and ancillary teams. Do we really need to put this in the booking path? That we are competing for so many things already, and perhaps, like you said, it's a matter of trust. Where do customers expect to see this? So I'd, I'd be curious to see how you uh, figure this one out. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think it's also like being more targeted in your communications. You know, who really wants to be hearing about this? Who's really engaged on this topic and making sure that you reach them, right? To your point, if only 1% are really engaging on this, then like an email blast to your entire customer base might not make sense, right? In terms of exactly. Exactly. It, I think it has to be specific enough. Um, still sticking to your net zero roadmap. I was very fascinated to see that almost 10%, um, in terms of pathways, almost 10% of, of this achievement will be through carbon removals uh, in 2050. As we know, at least today, carbon removals are very expensive. There are very few plants, like in Iceland, that currently do it. How do you intend to scale this to 10% of your decarbonization goals in uh, 2050? It's a good question. So for right now, the carbon removals that are reflected in our net zero roadmap are actually from SAF. Um, so a couple of the producers that we're working with, you know, as they use ca carbon capture and sequestration in their production process, that will ultimately make their SAF carbon negative. And so we're showing the carbon reduction from SAF up until net zero in the SAF wedge of our roadmap. And then all the additional carbon reduction beyond net zero is in the carbon removals wedge, which means that if you add up carbon removals and SAF, it's, it's a lot that's coming from SAF, right? I think, as you said, you know, things like direct air capture DAC are still really expensive. And if you consider the nearly 800 million metric tons that the global aviation industry emitted last year, there's not enough supply of DAC credits on the market, not even considering announced projects to address those emissions. Um, not to mention there are going to be other industries that will, will be competing for that same limited um, and expensive supply of credits. So I think our perspective is, you know, you obviously need carbon to create SAF, and we should be promoting the use of carbon capture and sequestration to further bring down the life cycle emissions of SAF. Um, I think from our side, that's probably the most likely applications for carbon capture removals for aviation until things like DAC scale and, you know, costs come down. You mentioned SAF producers who are using DAC. Is this someone like Air Company? Um, it could be something like Air Company in terms of, you know, capturing carbon in terms of a feedstock for PTL. And I think, you know, a lot of producers might have the opportunity to use um, carbon capture and sequestration to really just drive down the life cycle emissions of their SAF. Right. Okay. Fair enough. We looked at the pathways and the multiple pathways. If we think medium term to long term right now, not short term, we haven't really seen announcements from Southwest a bit like other airlines around electric airplanes or hydrogen airplanes. Are you currently working with or looking to work with some of these new generation of aircraft, uh, be it hydrogen or electric? Is that down the road for you? Well, we definitely think that alternative propulsion is an exciting concept, and we're actually monitoring the development of hydrogen, hybrid electric aircraft, all of that really closely. Uh, we've been doing a pretty comprehensive review of this market and there have been a lot of recent developments. You know, it's, it's a space that's moving very quickly. There's a lot of investment going into it. I think right now we're just we're not seeing any developments um, before at least the mid 2030s that would be relevant to our all narrow body, you know, point to point business model. Um, you're seeing a lot of companies in the near term that are working on smaller, shorter range aircraft that would be very relevant to airlines that operate regional aircraft. Right. And regional aircraft are pretty fuel inefficient. So it makes sense to try to replace those. And then you are seeing some concepts maybe on, you know, the blended wing body that are more suited to replace a wide body aircraft, which, you know, we don't fly. And those probably wouldn't be ready for entry into service until at least the mid to late 2030s. So I think from our side right now, we, we see hydrogen being really exciting, something that we want to continue to monitor, engage on and prepare for. Um, we do also see a lot of challenges, right, with, with hydrogen, even more so than what SAF has. So if you think about it, I mean, you still have to scale up a non-existent supply of, you know, green hydrogen versus SAF, but that fuel isn't a drop in, right? And it's not so easy to work with. Um, hydrogen is lighter, but it requires a lot more space. And then, of course, electric having the opposite problem <laughs> in that it's quite heavy. Um, but if you think about hydrogen, you know, that 
that jet that fuel will take up a lot of passenger and cargo space, which would increase the cost of flying for those remaining passengers. Um, and it's really expensive and and require a lot of changes for how airlines operate. You're talking about a brand new infrastructure for how you transport and store hydrogen. It requires a new aircraft, new engine. By the way, that that applies for electric as well. And that means certification and all of the challenges that come with that. Um, And then I think if you consider that aircraft have a life of around, you know, 25 to 30 years, once all those challenges are solved, it'll still take years for airlines to really incorporate any of that new aircraft into their fleet. So I think we see, you know, hydrogen has the potential to be zero emissions, and that's really important. So we want hydrogen, hydroelectric, all of those technologies to succeed. And that's why we're staying really engaged in this space. Um, To be perfectly honest, you know, at this point, we don't see it playing a, a, a significant role in 2050, but maybe 2060, 2070, if you just think about, you know, the years it will take to incorporate into fleets. But this is an area where I, I would love to be proven wrong. So, All right. Well, I, I agree that they will be fringe concepts uh, around 2050. But yes, hopefully they'll go mainstream. What I've heard with by having, you know, the CEO of Zero Avia or Universal Hydrogen on the show or some of the airline CEOs I've had on the show. It's the initial signals from the airlines that, you know, really are encouraging for some of these founders. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, watching the space uh, from, from Southwest as well. So we spoke about the future aircraft. The reality, though, is Southwest will be inducting almost 255 airplanes, all built using today's technology that you hope will be flying for another 35 to 40 years. That means... In reality, you have to eke out operational efficiencies and drive your sustainability goals using the current technology. How do you intend to do that? Yeah, well, definitely operational efficiency is core to our brand um, and who we are. And so, you know, modernizing our fleet, as you mentioned, it will be really critical to bringing down our carbon emissions intensity. The Dash 7s, Dash 8s have 14% lower fuel burn than their predecessors. And we're retiring, you know, the older, even like less um, fuel efficient aircraft. So that's going to be pretty significant. Um, but we are really focused on being more efficient in our operations. We actually recently announced, um, you know, goals to save 50 million gallons of incremental, incremental gallons of fuel by 2025 and um, to save 1.1 billion um, cumulative gallons of jet fuel by 2035. And that's relative to um, a 2019 baseline. So, you know, how are we going to do that? Well, we have to find ways to save fuel both on the ground and in the air. Um, we're also, you know, we have a goal to electrify 50% of our ground support equipment by 2030. Um, and we also have a goal to conserve energy in our facilities um, to reduce sort of our, our energy utilization index um, by 50% by 2035 in our Dallas headquarters. So I just mentioned those examples to say, like, we're, we're trying to find really every way across our operation where we can conserve fuel, conserve energy, um, and be more efficient. And that's going to be a, a key focus area for us um, through 2035. One of the ways I've heard, or two ways, and I'd love your perspective on both of these. One of the ways I've heard European airline CEOs come on the show and share with me, hey, you know what, Shashank, if there was a single European sky, we would save so much fuel today itself. Um, I, I remember KLM City Hopper uh, CEO telling me about a flight from Amsterdam to Porto, which flew the slowest and saved a lot of fuel. And yet it was the shortest block time just because they got the ATC clearances. Is this something that you're working on with the FAA? How's the response been in the US? I'm guessing it's easier in the US as opposed to a, a EU. It's funny because it's obviously not not been that easy to date, right? It's been taking it's taken a really long time for us to see improvements in this area. But you're right in the sense that compared to something like SAF, um, this is low hanging fruit, right? And it's, it really should be a no regrets move if we're serious as a country about reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we do work closely with the FAA on their next gen program. Obviously, the FAA's top priority is to ensure safety. From a sustainability lens, you know, we need the FAA to enable us to be more fuel efficient. And that means having an air traffic control system that allows for more direct routes to our destinations that would save fuel. And so you're right. You know, for example, right now we do fly routes through waypoints that don't allow for the most optimal routing or wind utilization. Um, And if we were able to fly more RNP approaches, that would get us to our destination faster. It would use less fuel. It would reduce tarmac delays, which would also save fuel and reduce ground-based emissions. So, you know, we've installed and we do use technology that allow for these RNP approaches. We were actually the first airline here in the U.S. to have a fully next-gen compatible fleet. 
But at the end of the day, we need to be able to leverage this technology more. And that is dependent on the FAA and ATC. So it's a big dependency for us on top of many other dependencies. And we would love to see, see some more progress in this area. I do wish you all the best on that. The one thing you can do tomorrow, though, is to avoid contrails. Uh, I know you recently spoke at a panel, uh, I think, with Google on contrails. I'd love to hear your view on contrail reduction. Is this something you're doing? Is this something you're collaborating on? What's your view? Absolutely. Um, well, yes, we are. We're doing all of the above. Uh, we're part of the Contrail Impact Task Force, which we actually helped to launch last year. We, we hosted the first workshop um, in our headquarters. And we are working on contrail detection and prediction research with a number of partners. Um, one of our partners is, is building a model to predict contrail formation. And we've connected them with our dispatchers to actually understand how would we incorporate, um, you know, contrail avoidance procedures, both from a flight planning as well as from an you know, in-flight perspective. We're doing desktop trials right now to help improve those models. As you probably know, it's it's incredibly difficult to predict when warming contrails will be formed. It's like trying to predict the weather with perfect accuracy. And it's also really challenging to verify whether or not an airline successfully avoided creating a warming contrail. Um, we're also working you know, with, with GE on this. GE was, was recently awarded a grant from the Department of Energy and GE's focused on developing you know, real-time um, in-flight prediction system for contrails. We're part of the project and really the intent here is to take engine data, on airplane data, and real-time observations to help predict those contrail formation. Um, and you mentioned, you know, I, I did teach a class recently on contrails with Google at the Global Business Travel Association Convention this year. Um, this is obviously a topic that corporate customers are starting to engage on, particularly as you know their companies think about the radiative forcing, you know, impacts of flying. Um, and I'll just recap maybe a little bit of the perspective we shared in that session. There, there has been recent scientific consensus, right, that contrails um, have an environmental impact. And we do know the conditions in which warming contrails are more likely to form, right? Those are your cold, humid regions, primarily at night. Um, in fact, daytime contrails can actually have a cooling effect. Um, and so it's also relatively straightforward to mitigate the impact, so, right? Airlines route around turbulence all the time today. So it's sort of like the same procedure that you would need to avoid forming a contrail. But there are some challenges, right? Unlike carbon emissions, where every gallon of jet fuel has the same impact, for contrails, only 10 to 15 percent of flights are responsible for about 80 percent of the of the impact, right? So this is more of a needle in the haystack problem. Not every flight is creating a contrail. Not every contrail will become a persistent contrail, and not every persistent contrail has a warming impact. Um, so a ton of variation. Flight by flight uh, depends on the route, the time of day, a lot of other factors. So I think the two biggest challenges that we see right now and that, you know, everyone in the task force is, is really working on, the first is improving the precision and accuracy of these models so that we're really confident that we know when a flight will or won't produce a warming contrail and that we've successfully avoided it. Um, there's obviously been a lot of progress on developing the models, but there's still a long way to go before you know, we're going to actually create control avoidance procedures around them, right? The second challenge, I think, is is understanding the trade-off between radiative forcing and global warming potential or contrails and, and CO2. So if by avoiding contrail formation, we actually burn more fuel, is that better for the environment? You know, how do we think about instantaneous warming uh, impacts versus emitting more carbon that'll be in the atmosphere for hundreds of years? It's a challenging question, and I don't think there's really consensus on that yet. And I think we've got to, we've got to kind of figure that out. Um, but for Southwest, this is an important issue. That's why we're co collaborating with so many organizations to improve sort of the research and understanding in the space. And we really joined the Contrail Impact Task Force um, for a few reasons. You know, first to better understand this issue um, and including how it applies to our business. You know, we don't fly red eyes. We don't fly transatlantic. Um, so those are the situations in which warming contrails are more likely to form. So what is the impact of our network? We want to understand that. Um, the second is, you know, we want to provide input on the real operational considerations of incorporating um, this, you know, avoidance procedures. We've got to prioritize safety right above all else. And so I think it's one thing to have a model to sit behind a desk to have the research. It's another to put that in a real world setting. And so we want to be able to provide sort of that input. Um, and of course, we want to make progress on just addressing this issue. We want to help advance 
the models, the accuracy, the quantification, and we want to help develop those um, potential solutions. Right. So is this collaboration giving you these answers? Is that the point? Like, will there be an analysis of your existing domestic network at the end of this uh, collaboration? We are working on that. And I would also say just, you know, in the task force, you've probably seen a number of airlines that are in the task force also making progress in this area. And we all benefit from that, right? Um, whether it's, you know, American working with Google and helping to improve the models or, you know, another airline, you know, Delta and MIT, um, I think all of the learnings that we bring together, it will just help to serve the understanding of the space, um, to help build more confidence in the models and, and the accuracy, and for ultimately the industry to deploy um, these solutions, right? So I think it's an area where collaboration makes a ton of sense, and that's why you're seeing a lot of that happen. Right. Well, I applaud you for firstly di- diving deep into uh, this topic. It's, it's definitely one of personal interest, and also for you know taking the lead and being part of this. Uh, Climate Task Force, I believe RMI uh, is leading the initiative there. Um, Until now, what we have spoken about is something passengers typically don't see, from contrails to future aircraft to uh, the SAF. No passenger can tell. But I believe Southwest has also been doing a lot of initiatives in terms of passenger experience and sustainability and circularity. Uh, Can you tell us a little about some of these passenger-focused or passenger-facing initiatives? Absolutely. Yeah. Circularity is one of our, our three pillars and single use plastics and onboard waste are, are really interesting. So, you know, airlines generate significant amounts of waste in our operations, and that does have an impact on the environment. Maybe compared to scope one emissions from jet fuel, the impact's smaller. But that being said, you know, single use plastics and waste are the most visible aspects of sustainability to our customers, you know, like, like you said, and our employees are also very passionate about it. Um, and so we want to strike the right balance of, you know, focusing our efforts on where we will have a lot of impact with a topic that is incredibly important to our people. Um, so we've spent a lot of time over the last few months trying to even better understand our waste footprint and identify, you know, where we have gaps in data that we need to address um, to tackle this issue. For onboard food and beverage service specifically, we actually recently announced a goal to reduce um, our single-use plastics by 50%. That's by 2025, and that's by weight and compared to a 2022 baseline. Um, and we also have a goal to eliminate single-use plastics where feasible by 2030. So you can expect to see some exciting updates in those areas soon. And actually, if you think about, you know, it, Southwest has served canned water in our uh, in-flight service for over 25 years. Um, if you take a step back and look at just sort of our cabin service broadly, you know, we don't serve food on our planes. We don't generate food waste outside of our snacks. And most of those are consumed, by the way. Uh, our customers do bring food and food service items on the plane, but we don't offer a lot of those items that are single use in that turn into waste, like cutlery or plateware, amenity kits, blankets. So from that perspective, you know, we generate far less waste in our in our service. Um, but we know that there's still work to be done. And so right now we are really focused on reducing single use plastics in our snack and beverage service. Um, we're also really focused on recycling. You know, we've had a recycling program for over 15 years. Um, we recognize that we can do a better job. I think we can all always do a better job. And so that's why, you know, we're also um, focused on working on improving recycling. And that's throughout our operation, not just for in-cabin. How's the response been from the passengers or the crew to this? I'm guessing the crew has to do more work, not less, if they have to sort recycling, for example, in flight. I would say they need more consistent work probably, but um, but also they need the tools, the processes, the training to enable them to do it. Um, we've actually seen a ton of great response. In fact, when we survey our employees, you know, twice a year, um, we hear from them, you know, through a lot of our, you know, employee channels and recycling is the number one most important initiative to our, to our people. So our flight attendants, um, uh, ground operations, provisioning agents, our, you know, supply chain, corporate facilities, everyone has just been so um, excited about our efforts to improve recycling. They're very engaged, um, very focused on this. And it's a difficult, you know, challenge to tackle in funny, in a very different way from something like SAF. Um, And so really the five focus areas that we've laid out are around, you know, governance on getting better data, you know, from our, from our vendors and from our airports on um, expanding education, you know, uh, we've hired a ton of new people over the past few years, every every airline has. And so you want to make sure that they have the training in place to know, you know, how to implement these best practices. 
Um, access, you know, to the right containers with the right signage, all of that's really important. And then just driving consistency across our system. So, you know, that's sort of our, our focus areas right now on recycling. And we're also working with our airports to determine, you know, what our communities can do to recycle and how we can adjust our procedures to really reduce contamination in our recycling streams. Got it. Uh, that's very exciting. And, and thank you for sharing this, this feedback you've been receiving. Um, as we wrap up this interview, I, what comes to mind is I had a chat with, um, I think it was uh, Scott Kirby at United, and he talked about United Ventures, and he was really excited about it. Uh, Emilia Di Luca at Delta shared with me how Delta is having this Delta Innovation Lab. All of these are efforts for airlines, and JetBlue, of course, has JetBlue Ventures, uh, and I had uh, Amy Burr from there on the show as well. All of these efforts by airlines are to engage with the ecosystem. Are we about to see an effort from Southwest as well, like a Southwest Ventures or a Southwest Innovation Lab where you're working with startups? Uh, are you going to be more proactive because I haven't seen any announcement there yet? You might see something from us in the, in the, in the coming years. You know, I, um, we, we've made an investment in Sapphire Renewables, as I mentioned earlier, and um, that's that was without having a venture fund in place, right? That, that is not the type of investment we typically do, but it goes to show how important sustainability is to our executives and to our leadership. Um, and I think, you know, we want to be really smart about how we um, invest in this space. For us, the primary goal is to get SAF, right? Um, SAF to hit our goals, um, SAF that meets sort of our, our criteria, um, that is affordable, that is, you know, certified, has, you know, low um, life cycle emissions, um, everything on that side. But we do partner, you know, across the board. Um, if you think about like from a supplier standpoint, we're working with your established producers, but also startups, right? And those are some of the offtakes that we've announced in Sapphire that are earlier on in commercialization. And we're also engaged in R and D. I mean, we partner with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory (NREL) on really earlier stage technology, and that's how we were first introduced to Sapphire as an opportunity. Um, and it's not just NREL. You know, we work with other consortiums, and we see a lot of value in engaging on R and D as a funnel into our pipeline. I do think you know we are. Uh, uniquely positioned in the space and that, you know, we're the only investment grade airline. And so when we come to the table as a partner for some of these producers, whether that's an offtake or, you know, an investment, that's incredibly um, important for them and for uh, their um, uh, project to scale. So I think that's sort of how we, we think about it. And so hopefully uh, more to come. We don't have a venture fund at this point, but we have made an investment in this area and we are um, very engaged across the value chain. Thank you. You've shared a lot without sharing any forward-looking statements. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's, that's good. Um, final question. It's something I love to ask every guest. What gives you the most hope about the future of sustainable aviation, Helen? You know, I think it's the collaboration and momentum that we're seeing in this space. Um, I love how, you know, every one of us is challenging the other to do better. And that any progress that one of us makes is progress for the industry. Um, there has been, you know, no slowdown in, in momentum in environmental sustainability and aviation. And that gives me a lot of encouragement, um, whether that's momentum from the government, momentum from the private sector. Um, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult challenge. But I think with everyone that has been, you know, putting all of their effort uh, behind this, I, I do see us, you know, getting there. I'm on the same page as you here. Uh, I really feel different competitors working together, uh, different parts of the ecosystem working together. Um, you know, I, I truly appreciate the you, know, you going deep and being upfront about a lot of these issues. Now, the final part of this interview is what I call the rapid fire round, in which our listeners, hopefully your colleagues uh, and friends, get to know you a bit better uh, on a personal level. And I'll ask simple one-line questions and you can reply one word or one simple phrase uh, answers. Like, what's your favorite movie? Um, The Dark Knight. I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan, so maybe Interstellar would be a second, but like The Dark Knight for sure. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite book? Harry Potter, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Really? I love it. It's the same for my wife as well. She she dragged me to a lot of the movies when she had finished reading all the books. <laughs> if you're going to reread a book right now, it's probably going to be Harry Potter. Let's, let's be real. Let's be real. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite city, Helen? I really love the Bay Area. It's where I grew up. Uh, good food, good weather, um, a lot of nature. So yeah, I'd pick the Bay Area. 
That's nice. Uh, if not Southwest, what's your favorite airline? No, I don't. I don't think there is another favorite airline. It's just Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is something you want to learn? Um, I would love to kind of relearn Mandarin. You know, when I was younger, I was I was more fluent, but I've really lost it. <laughs> so, tien, 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 tien. Tien, tien. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good. I I grew up I grew up in Singapore, so my I actually took courses in Mandarin, and at one point I was good enough to negotiate and bargain in Beijing in Mandarin. Uh, but your Mandarin is definitely better than mine because I can probably like, order some food at a restaurant. <laughs> it it was. Now I can just get a gist of the conversation if it's going on around me, and then nobody you knows. And I can take some classes together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, what is the best advice you've received? You know, in my first job, um, I was in consulting, and a partner told me to always assume positive intent. And I think that's just been really helpful advice,、um, whether that's you know a team that you're leading or or coworkers, but also just in your personal life. I think it's helpful to to keep that in mind. Right. What do you do in your free time?、Um, if I get any free time, two little ones just like you,、um, I try to climb. So bowl、oh, wow. top rope, like indoor indoor climbing, and then followed by some good food. You know. What are you doing in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of indoor climbing. Indoor climbing. All right, indoor climbing. I'll I'll give you indoor climbing. Sure. Climbing、uh, final. Do you, know, you, you do it indoors. So. Final two questions. If you were on an 18-hour long-haul flight, who would you like to be seated next to? And this can be a person dead or alive. Dead or alive. Um. Well, I'd probably go with alive, and、uh, I would pick Josh Home. Okay. Why is that? Um, Josh Homme is、uh, my favorite musician.、Um, his band, Queens of the Stone Age. I'm obsessed with Queens of the Stone Age. In fact, I'm going to go see them here, like in a week. So,、uh, you know, hopefully, I'll, I'll get to the very front. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that.、Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic.、Uh, to the front of your favorite uh, uh, performer.、Um, and finally, if we are to speak one year from now and we are popping champagne, what are we celebrating? Uh, hopefully, I'm climbing V5 by then. <laughs> all right. I would love to get to. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the best, Helen. I really enjoyed this conversation, and、uh, thank you so much for、uh, leading with your action at Southwest when it comes to sustainability. Thanks for having us on your show.、Um, I think it's really important to to highlight, you know, the challenges and the progress that are being made,、um, and we're just excited to have been able to participate. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries, yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future, so please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplyflying. That's simply with an i. dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green. dot simplyflying. dot com and join the movement. Sustainability in the air is an original podcast by Simplyflying. The show is produced by Uri Toth in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor, based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India, and Mira Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show, based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore, and I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying, and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.